death to them who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Divine appointments, and I guess that's what your dad had, a divine appointment. It is appointed unto man once to die. Exodus chapter 25, verse 22. Welcome to all of those who are visiting on the uh, video, whatever medium you're getting it at or from. And to all who are in the house today, thank you for being here. We, Diane and I, appreciate you so much. You are so faithful to pray and to attend our Bible studies and to uh, worship the Lord in your givings. And we... Don't take that lightly. We appreciate it so much. So we love all of you. And uh, we welcome you to this Bible study. And as I said a few minutes before we turn the video on, please open your yourself to truth today. Truth that you don't know can't help you. So open yourself to truth so you can understand. It's good to see Vinny come in. Vinny, we were just enjoying our uh, TV before you got here. We what a good song, so thank you. Thank you, Glad I was able to help. Thank you very much. And did you have, did, did your dad have a nice 92nd birthday? 94th, you mean? Uh, 94th? Yeah, he's 94. He's two years older than I thought he was. I know his age. No, I have to do 94. <laughs> he's 94, and when he saw the bag of chocolate, he said, he did his typical, oh, yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> this way. He that keeps it beside his doing. Yeah, well, Diane, I'll be honest and let you know not to take up too much time. He keeps it beside his bedside, so that means he really values it. <laughs> yeah, when I get 92, I want some chocolates too. Why wait that long? When I get 120, I want some more. <laughs> Exodus 25, 22. The Lord had instructed Moses how to build the tabernacle. For God had said to him, Build me a place that I may dwell among them. And uh, so he gave meticulous directions, specific measurements, told him what kind of materials to use, what colors to use, what dimensions to make things. God was very meticulous because God was building it through Moses and through Bezalel and those, those artifice, artificers, is that what you, how you would say it? You did, we don't know. Art yeah. I guess. What's no, the right word there, Lois? Artificers. Artificers. Huh? Artisans? Artisans. There you go. How did I get artificers out of that? <laughs> anyway, uh, there were people that were anointed and filled with the spirit of wisdom to do that work. And so God had instructed him to do it. And here's what God said. Verse 22, Exodus 25. And there I will meet with thee and I will commune. And the there that he was talking about was behind the veil at the Ark of the Covenant where the mercy seat was and the archangels were there. All of this was a pattern of how things really exist in heaven. And uh, God said, now you build it here, build a pattern, build it after the pattern. And I will there meet with you and commune with you. He was talking to Moses. Then he tells Moses, and I don't have this written, but he goes on to tell Moses and tell the people that outside in the outer court where the brazen altar is, between the brazen altar and the door to the holy place, not the holy of holies, but the holy place, Tell them that's where I will meet with them. So God was setting up a meeting place. If you can just uh, comprehend it that way. 
And I almost entitled this today, instead of divine appointments, I almost entitled it, A Place Called There. In the Old Testament, there, on various occasions, seemed to be a natural earthly place. But in the New Testament, it took on a spiritual dimension. And although it may have been a place, it was a spiritual place that God said, I will meet you there. Now, I realize that God can hear you pray from anywhere and that God can minister to you anywhere. But when God wants to take care of private business with you, he makes an appointment. Sometimes you're not even aware of that appointment. Until it comes. But most of the time, God wants you to know when and where. Okay? So what, that's what we're talking about, divine appointments. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 17, For the flesh and the spirit are contrary to one another, so that you cannot do the things that you should. In other words, the flesh and the spirit are always at odds, vying for headship in your life. Before Adam sinned, that war did not exist. Adam was spirit driven, but after he sinned, he was then ruled by the flesh. The flesh became dominant over the spirit. But in Galatians it's telling us the flesh and the spirit are contrary to one another so that the flesh keeps you from doing the things that you should do. You see, beyond the veil, which is to say this life, the Bible says that Jesus' flesh was represented in the veil. And that when his flesh was ripped and torn and sacrificed on the cross, that God, from the top to the bottom, ripped the veil into and made a way into the holy place. So that we understand that the place where the flesh ends is where the spirit begins. And there are some things in life that flesh cannot accomplish and you have to go beyond the veil so that the spirit can accomplish it because the flesh cannot get it done. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. Mm -hmm. So beyond the veil is where flesh efforts cease and the Holy Spirit takes charge. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God doth reveal them to us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. So we are told plainly, that flesh and blood cannot access the things that God has already prepared for us. They are in another place. And flesh and blood cannot access those things. It takes the Spirit to unveil them to us. But they are already prepared and they are already real and they are already ours. But we have to, by the Spirit, access those things. In Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 2. Arise and go down to the potter's house, Jeremiah. For there, say there. Yeah. There, there, I will cause thee to hear my words. Why? 
Why do you want me to go there, Lord? Why can't you just talk to me here? <laughs> Obedience is, the, is one of the first laws of the kingdom. The law of order is the first law, but obedience is the second law. You have to be obedient in the realm of the Spirit or you will not get what it is that you're seeking. Obedience is necessary. God said, go down to the potter's house, Jeremiah, for there, there, say there, 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 there I will make you to hear my words. Why? Because his words had to do with what was going on at the potter's house. And God wanted Jeremiah not only to hear the word, but to see things that were in conjunction with what he was saying. So God said, I'm making an appointment with you, and that is the place where you can get what you need. We need to be more sensitive to God. We're missing a lot of stuff, a lot of things, a lot of revelation because we don't hear the appointments. Hello. Now, in Genesis chapter 46, verses 2, 3, and 4, And God spake unto Israel in a vision of the night. Now, Israel is... Jacob, after he's wrestled with the angel, his name got changed to Israel. So the children of Israel are the twelve sons and their families of Jacob, the children of Israel. And God spake unto Israel in a vision of the night, that's a dream, y'all, and said, Jacob, Jacob, and he said, here am I. And he said, I am the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. I will go down into Egypt with thee, and I will surely bring thee up again. Now hear me. God said, go down to Egypt, for there is where I will make of you a great nation. Boy, the flesh would never plan that. If Egypt was directly opposite of what Israel was. Egypt worked, worshipped all kinds of gods. They, they threw their babies in the Nile River to appease their gods. Egypt was heathenistic. God's people, Israel, were not of that breed. And yet God said, don't be afraid. Because Jacob, quite frankly, was having some uh, trepidation about going down there. There was a famine where he was, and the 70 people in his family at that time were hungry and in, in threat of starvation. They were looking for food. And his sons said, there's food down in Egypt. And you know the story, that one of Jacob's sons that he thought was dead was down in Egypt at that time and God had given him a dream, like father, like son, how about that? Yeah. Dreamers. Right. And he had the solution to the food problem, the famine that was coming, and Pharaoh took him out of prison and put him second in command of all the nations. And Jacob didn't even know he was still alive, much less that he had that kind of authority down in Egypt. And he was afraid to go down to Egypt. He didn't want to go down there, but God spoke to him in a dream. God can speak to you in a dream and, and make you willing to do things you wouldn't normally do. This is the truth. And he can do that with your boss. He can do that with political figures. 
He can do that with anybody. He did it with Nebuchadnezzar, a heathen king. God can give people dreams and speak to them in their subconscious, and they cannot object. Now, here he is, not knowing whether to go down there or not, but the Lord said, don't, don't fret about that anymore, Jacob. Go on down there because that's where I will make of you a great nation. And that's where 70 people became close to two and a half million people. A great nation was within a nation. So much so that the Egyptians didn't want to let them go because they were a great workforce. And it took God convincing them to let them go. And that's a whole different message. But you have to understand, God said, that is the place where I'm going to prosper you. God can prosper you in your furnace. Yes. My Bible says that God told the people, I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. One of the letters that Paul wrote, he wrote it to the church at Babylon. Babylon? God, listen, God can build a church on the doorsteps of hell. That's right. God's not, he's not hampered like we are. But the fact is, he said, that's the place where I am going to make a great nation out of you. That defies all logic and all reason. And you have to know you've heard from God to make that kind of decision. So we did. He went down there and God did just exactly what he said he was going to do. Now, that's where Jacob died, but he didn't die until he saw his son alive. Yeah. Jacob got a miracle. His son that he thought had been dead for years, that he grieved over, was alive. And not only that, but he had two grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Yeah. And Jacob got to lay his hands on them and pray over his grandchildren. Wow, what a blessing. Had he not gone there, he would have missed that. Listen, we need to hear the Spirit tell you where there is for you. Amen. 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 I'm, I'm trusting and believing that this is the there for many of you. Amen. So, here we go. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 2 through 4. And the word of the Lord came unto Elijah saying, Get thee hence, and turn eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook. And I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. There. He hadn't commanded the ravens to feed him somewhere else. He had commanded the ravens to feed him there. Look with me, if you will, at the next scripture, which is found in 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 9. Arise, get thee to Zarephath. For behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. There. That's twice God has told Elijah the first time, go down to the brook Cherith. For there you will get sustenance. And he did. And God did what he said. Then God says to him, now, go on down to Zarephath, for there I have commanded a widow woman to sustain thee. In other words, he had to go from point A to point B, because both of them were divine appointments where God said, there is where you need to be to get what you need. Isn't that interesting? That's how God is, though. He knows what, when, where, how, and why to do something. 
Amen? So, he went on down and the widow woman there sustained him for three and a half years. But, you know, God's never about a win-lose situation. He's always about a win-win situation. Not only did that woman bless the man of God, he blessed her. Yeah. Raised her son from the dead yeah. and, uh, and caused her meal and oil to not run out for three and a half years. So uh, it was a win-win situation. God always works both ends against the middle. He does not sponsor losing. He wants you to win. Obedience is crucial in the kingdom of God. If you don't do what he says to do, you will miss your blessing. Amen. In the game of football that men probably are more into than women, although some women are into it. Interesting. A quarterback who is the guy that receives the snap, he receives the ball from the center. And then he's got the ball, he can run with it, he can pass it off to somebody else who will run with it, he can pitch it out to somebody who will run with it, he can fall, fall on back a few yards and throw it to somebody down the field. But what you have to understand is that that quarterback is not throwing that ball to a person. He is throwing it to a spot. The person in the huddle that is supposed to run that route, zigzag or across and then back or however he runs the route, the ball is going to be thrown to the spot that was agreed upon in the huddle because that is the there where the ball will be. That's that's a metaphor of what we're talking about here. God says, there is where you can catch your blessing. You won't catch it over on the other side or back up this way. you got to be there because that's where I'm going to produce your blessing, your solution, your answer. So it takes obedience to be there at the right time. Right place, right time. A lot of times we do things because we think we are doing it for one reason, but God intended it for something else. I've had people that came to church and they thought they just made that decision to do so, and they found out after the, that they got there, God brought them there. Oh, yes. yeah. There. There. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 10. And Elisha sent a messenger out to Naaman. Naaman was a high-ranking officer in a foreign government, foreign army. He was a leper, and he was dying. A little handmaiden who had been captured as a prisoner in, in battle, she was an Israelite, but she obviously liked Naaman. She was his wife's handmaiden, and she said, if you will tell your husband, that there is a prophet in Israel. And if he will go there, he can be healed. Impossible to heal leprosy. Leprosy was a death sentence. So he went. My Bible says here in chapter 5, verse 10 of 2 Kings, when Naaman got there, and Elisha sent a messenger out to Naaman, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan River seven times, and thou shalt be healed. But Naaman was wroth and went away. 
Now, he was not only angry, he was offended and angry. Because he said, I thought at least he in person would come out and speak to me. But he sent a messenger out to me. That was disrespectful to me. I think God was saying, what's more important to you, respect or healing? Anyway, somebody, some of his people who cared about Naaman, evidently he was, he was, he was a good guy to those that uh, were around him. They said, sir, if he'd have told you to do some kind of a great thing, you would have done it. This is just a simple thing. He said, yeah, but there's better rivers over in where I'm from than the Jordan River. They said, it's nevertheless... Just do what he said. Yep. Give it a chance. So, huffing and puffing. <laughs> you ever done anything huffing and puffing? Yeah. How many times did my daddy call me back as I was going to do what I was told to do, but I was huffing and puffing? <laughs> I think I can help you, son. You know, what you do is not the only issue. How you do it is also important. So, huffing and puffing, he went on down there and he dipped once, twice, three times, four times. But he dipped a half a dozen times. He was still leprous. No change. And it looked like he had played the fool that he had been embarrassed and tricked and that he was just a sucker. <laughs> but one more time was all it took. Do you know how many people give up on the brink of a miracle? Yeah. Mm. They throw in the towel just right before the breakthrough. We need to persevere to the end. It's not the one who runs the swiftest. It's not the one who shines for a day. But the one that endures to the end, he shall be saved. Takes tenacity. You got to be like that old bulldog. Just hang on. You know, you know how a bulldog got its name? They got that pudged up nose. They used to put bulldogs in the arena to fight with the bulls because a bulldog could latch on to that bull while that bull was thrashing around and he could still breathe with that pushed up nose while holding on. Other dogs would have to let go to breathe. That's how it's called a bulldog. But in so doing, that breed of dog got inbred into it a tenacity that don't know how to let go. And sometimes Christian needs to be as stubborn about the things of God as they are about their finances or as they are about their, their will. They need to have some bulldog tenacity of the spirit and not let go. So here's this man one more time. He dipped and he came up and instantly his skin had no leprosy. Guess what? He had to go there. It wasn't good enough for him to go a different direction or a different place. Go wash in the Jordan River seven times and thou shalt be healed. But Naaman was angry and offended. But he still did what he was told to do. Would you rather your child obediently do what you tell them to do and be sweet but behind the scenes be rebellious against you and hate your guts? Nope. Or would you rather them fuss and complain and kick the, the the couch and all of that and go on and do what you told them to do. 
Submission and obedience are two things that go together. You submit, but that's not enough. You've got to obey. You can obey and not be submitted, and you can submit and not obey. You've got to do both. Amen. So, he did, he did what he needed to do, and God healed him. And he came back grateful and tried to give Elijah money. Elijah wouldn't take it. Psalm chapter 133, verses 1 through 3. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in <coughs> unity. It is like the six quarts of precious anointing oil that is poured upon Aaron's head, that runs down upon his beard and all the way to the hem of his garment, like the dew of Mount Hermon that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there, say there, there. for there the Lord commanded the blessing. There where? At the anointed place. At the place of the anointing. At the place of the, of the unity that draws the anointing. That there is where God commands blessings. We have to learn to be obedient. 1 Kings 18, 41. And Elijah said to King Ahab, he'd already called fire from heaven, already seen the 850 prophets of Baal and the prophets of the grove destroyed. Fire had fallen, just demolished the sacrifice and the altar and the water and all that he'd poured. Now the real issue was about to happen, and that was the rain. Hadn't rained in three and a half years. The land was parched and dry. The people had no money because they had no crops. And listen to what he says. And Elijah said to King Ahab, Get thee up, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Now, you got to know that Elijah had already, after the fire fell and after the dust of the battle had settled, he went over on the top of Mount Carmel there and he got down on his hands and knees, put his face down to the ground, facing down toward the sea, and he told his servant, go and look out over the ocean tell, and come back and tell me what you see. And the reason I want you to do that because... There is a sound of abundance of rain. I want you to go see what I'm hearing. Now, here, try to feature this, will you? Elijah was tuned in to the Spirit of God closely enough that he knew out there he was hearing. They said, you ever hear something and you... You knew what direction it was coming from. You might not have known what it was, but you knew you turned toward where it was coming from. Feature this. Elijah said to the servant, There is a sound of abundance of rain. There is a sound of abundance. And when he got ready to talk to Ahab, Get thee up. Get off of this mountain. For there is a sound of abundance of rain. He found that. You see what I'm saying? He wasn't saying, I, I, I just, I'm, I'm just hearing the sound of it. I hear it from there. There is an abundance, a sound of abundance of rain. You have to go where God is working. You don't know what God wants to do in the place you find yourself. You don't know how you got there. How, why am I doing here? How many times have I heard that? What am I doing on this job? Why am I still living in this place? Hello. It's 
your there until God gives you a new there. Because there is where God commands the blessing for you. Hello. And it's obedience that gets the job done. Acts chapter 8. Turn over with me to the book of Acts chapter 8. I'm going to start reading at uh, verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Now, you got to know, he was in Samaria, preaching. Jesus had resurrected. The church had its grand beginning. The Spirit of God had been poured out. And here's a, now he, Philip uh, wasn't known for anything really great but he had a super good revival going on in, in Samaria. But right in the middle of that, God says to him, now you head south and go down there and get on that road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert area. Leaving the city, leaving the comfort zone, leaving where things seem to be going well and just you know people talk about well things are going south on me <laughs> Philip, Philip my, this may be where that term started I don't know but anyway verse 27 and he arose and went he didn't argue about it didn't question it he just went and behold a man of Ethiopia a eunuch of great authority under Candace queen of the Ethiopians who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah, or Isaiah the prophet. When the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Go near and join thyself to this chariot. He hadn't been invited. And the Bible says, And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I except somebody should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Verse 32, The place of the scripture which he read was this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth. Verse 34. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh this prophet? Of himself or of some other man? And Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, it wasn't the eunuch's way anymore, and it wasn't just Philip's way, it was their way. They had jo Listen, what God joins you to, you're joined. Mm -hmm. You didn't get to vote. You are not the one who joined. God joined you. And when God joins you, you lose your options. You stay joined till God unjoins you. You hear me? They went on their way. Now, look. Uh, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, that the eunuch saw him no more, 
And he went on his way rejoicing. The eunuch went on his way rejoicing. Verse 40. But Philip was found at Azotus. And passing through, he preached all into all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Now, you see the hand of God that told this man where to go. Had he not gone there, not only would Philip have missed his blessing, this eunuch would have missed his miracle. God doesn't always just do something for you. He's using you to do something for somebody else as well. And he'll bless you in the process. Now, Philip went in obedience. But once he got there and got finished, the Bible says he was caught away by the Spirit. The Spirit caught him away and he was found down at Azotus. He probably came to himself and said, how did I get here? <laughs> I, I don't know the details, but I do know this. He made the decision to go on the first leg of that journey. The second leg of that journey, God took him by the Spirit and transported him. Now, I want you to see that most of the scriptures I've read to you where God told the prophets and God told the people, for there, I will bless thee, it was a physical, earthly place, and they got there by being obedient. And now you see a transition. Philip here starts out hearing and obeying and taking himself down there and finding this chariot. And then the Spirit takes over. Somewhere on this journey, he went beyond the veil. And he got into the realm of the Spirit. And now he's not doing the traveling. The Spirit is doing the traveling. He's just in the Spirit. Look out now. I want you to understand with me. I, I... I saw the other day, I don't know if I was asleep or awake, I really don't, but I saw and I remember seeing a placid river, beautiful, like a mountain stream, but it was, it was bigger than a stream, it was a, it was a river. It was flowing smoothly and gently through the valley. And in what I was seeing, I knew that on down the river, there was something there that I needed to get to. And so I'm standing there on the bank of this river, looking at it flow, and the question comes to my mind, now, how am I going to get down river? And I looked down the river bank and it was dead trees and stumps and high grass and weeds and, and steep uh, uh, banks and, and, and all kinds of impediments and stuff down there and it was going to be a chore and it was going to be meticulous effort trying to get downstream or I could just jump in that river and float down I was up in Helen, Georgia uh, some time back. All of you probably been to Helen back. Beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> but you can, they, they, it's a beautiful river flowing through. I guess it's the Tacoa River. I'm not sure what river it is. Chattahoochee. Is it Chattahoochee? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Chattahoochee. Way down yonder. Or way up yonder. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it's still clean. <laughs> But uh, you can stand there on just about any given day in the, in the warm months and you can see people tubing. They, they're just floating in large numbers coming down that river and they don't have to paddle, they don't have to 
strain and stress and they're not out trying to walk with their bare feet down the, the banks. They're just letting that water take them yeah. down the river. It's called a flow or a current. Yeah. It's a river. Did uh, you ever notice that when Jesus went and sat on the well in Samaria, when the woman came to draw water from the well, Jesus said, if, if you just ask me, I would give you living water. Now, living water is, is, is uh, um, defined as active, uh, lively, moving, flowing water with a current. Moving water. Now what she had in that well was stationary water. It was good for sustenance. But when you've got water that is alive, that means it's active, it's moving, it can take you somewhere. Some of the major arteries of commerce in this nation early on were the rivers. Oh yeah. It was an artery of business. Mm -hmm. The Mississippi, I, the Mississippi's in a sad state, y'all. It's yeah. just drying up. It probably found out what's going on in Washington. Just sat a lot. I don't know my head. <laughs> that in the Missouri. But all you got to do is get in it. It'll take you somewhere. Living water is moving. And Jesus said to the woman, this here, this here is one kind of water, but I'll give you living water. How many of you know that when John sees heaven, he sees the river of life? Rivers don't see.